Welcome to the Pharos Fit Podcast, where we help you to explore your capacity to move better, push further, and achieve your limitless potential through fitness, nutrition, recovery, and lifestyle. Hey guys, welcome back to the Pharos Fit Podcast. Uh, good to be back with you guys again. Uh, I'm here with my wife, Emily Cavell. Hey. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Very good. Good. I'm here with Brandon, my producer. Hey, Brandon, how are you doing? Good, good. How's everybody doing today? Good? Good, yeah. good, good. Uh, and I'm also here with uh, Mark Crampton. Mark is my new guru, both in business and in life. Uh, I'm going to introduce <laughs> him to you guys in a second. Um, but the reason why we're starting this podcast off in, in such a good state is because Mark just took us through a, a box breathing session. Um, and Mark, before we introduce you, just just tell the listeners briefly what the what the box breathing is and how it can help them. Right, right. So box breathing is linked to mental toughness and arousal control. Hmm. So part of arousal control is to reduce your anxiety, your blood pressure, your heart rate, all that. And the five second sequence of box breathing just helps reduce that mm. and set your day so and you're inhaling for five seconds holding at the top for five exhaling for five holding at the bottom for five right and as you get better at it you can actually increase that time right isn't in the original one 10 seconds well you <laughs> want to the just, pr on box breathing yeah. <laughs> Mark? i want to know what's the best you, you just keep it at five seconds it's not a competition <laughs> And you want to just gain the benefit of that reduction in anxiety or arousal or, you know, your temper's going, your emotion is kicking up, whatever it would be. Or the yeah, pre-podcast so, jitters. Yeah. yeah. Mark, Mark does this drill, this drill. You do this drill first thing in the morning, right? I do. You wake up. Yeah. I've been doing it like at night, especially if I can't sleep. It helps me, helps me calm down. Um, but you were mentioning before about intention, like always know what your intention is before you go into it. Right. That helps you focus yeah. on your day too. Mm. So if you do have an intention, like we talked about respect, learn, lighthearted, yeah. and listen, those four things before we did our box breathing. And we focused on that for three minutes. Yeah, that was great. Right. I mean, it sets the tone for this, right? The whole point of this podcast is to listen to each other. Hopefully we learn some things that we are in a sphere of respect that, you know, uh, all of our voices matter and that we can be lighthearted enough to, you know, have a good time. Yeah. I was into it. And that was your, that was you. You came in with that. And I was like, oh, way to just take charge. He's not on our <laughs> podcast. We are on his time now. Exactly. exactly. So guys, uh, Mark Crampton is a, um, uh, he retired as a command master chief uh, in the Navy SEALs. Uh, he currently works for um, SealFit as an independent contractor. He is a father. He's a grandfather and a family man. He is a man with a, a strong sense of, of purpose, and he's on a on a mission right now. And I have the good, or me and Emily have the, the good fortune of Mark um, connecting with us, uh, helping us with our business, helping us with our outlook, helping us structure our days, our weeks, our months, and our our, our lives uh, better. Uh, helping us grow both as as people and as as business people, and um, really just being, you know, a, a trusted source of um, help <laughs> in every sense of the word, whether it be like our our mindset or how we deal with uh, employees or, or the business itself, or uh, having a more concrete purpose. Um, being more conscious about what we're doing and, and, and how we make decisions and that kind of thing. So uh, Mark's kind of becoming more and more uh, invaluable to me. And I want to share a little bit of him with you guys. Not too much because I kind of want to keep him to myself, but I'm going to share a little bit a little bit <laughs> of him today. Um, Mark. Yes, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate no, it. No, I thank you and Emily for having me up here. And I really appreciate it and your kindness to me and my family. Thank you. So brother. thank you so much. Um, I guess we'll start with with your journey. Um, obviously, you are doing things now uh, that that you arrived at through a, through a process uh, and things you've uh, right you know learned along the way. So let's take it right back to the beginning. Let, let's talk a little bit about you know childhood, where you grew up, what your influences were when you were growing up, and how how everything kind of got started. Okay. Well, I was born in Hamilton, Ohio in June of 1959. And Hamilton is northwest of Cincinnati, about 25 miles on the Great Miami River. Mm. 
and it was a manufacturing town, middle class, skilled labor, and I was in that type of family. My dad was a mechanical engineer. He came down from Canada. My mother migrated up from Appalachia, Kentucky, and the two met in Hamilton. So I had a good middle class upbringing there and graduated from high school, from Hamilton Taft High School, played football and wrestled some. And the influences were my father. I had an uncle on my mother's side that was very influential to me. Uh, He was a dairy farmer, so I worked a lot on his farm, and he introduced me to a lot of outdoor activities Mm -hmm. and responsibility young like driving a tractor or, you know, taking care of animals, that type of thing. And I always really flourished outside and working. Like I liked physical work and I liked working out, like lifting weights, running, you know, everything about being outside. I really flourished outside, probably hyperactive, you know, and wanted to burn that energy off growing up. But a very good middle class family. And after high school, I sort of bumped around a little bit. What does that mean? I went to college uh, at Western Kentucky University for a year. And then I moved down to Texas and worked in the oil fields and went to Midland Junior College. And I was in Midland, Odessa area of Texas, West Texas. It's like the moon (laughs) out there. And from there, I joined the Navy at 21. 21. But Did it come from this physical, like you love being physical, so you were like, I guess I'm just going to get into something that throws me into... You know what was interesting? At 21, I had this calling like was that was unfulfilled in my gut. Like, okay, I have more to offer. And it was this adventure seeking thing intuition that was just talking to me like you still have something to to do here was it more about adventure than it was about like service yes at that time i think it was and the funny thing that happened was i actually took the army entrance exam and i was just looking at being a reserve and I go to talk to the Army recruiter one day, and he's door locked, and right next door is the Navy guy. And his is open. Oh, and shit. he rushes out and grabs me, and he's like, hey, don't you want to join the Navy? This is Midland, <laughs> Texas. There's no ocean around here. And I go, well, what does the Navy have that's combatant? Like, you got to understand, in 1982, when I enlisted, the Navy SEALs, no one— We'd heard of frogmen, but certainly not Navy SEALs. Right. Not in a common way. Right. Right. There was no brand like that. Right, right, right. And he said, well, we have the Navy SEALs. And I go, well, what is that? You know, explain that to me. So we went through this process that naturally drew me in to want to try that. Yeah, the universe just had other plants for you. Yeah, you walked crazy. in and the door was the, the, it was the no one was there. So it was very interesting. And we did this three month because even in 82, I'm like, you know, I don't want the recruiter lying to me or setting me up. You, you yeah. Know. Yeah. Sure. And uh, he was legit and took three months and got education material on it. And it was a big commitment back then, like four year commitment to the Navy. And uh, a high attrition rate, obviously, for the program. Right, so, right. So yeah. you you initially signed up for the four years, but you ended up doing how many? How many years? Did you I did twenty seven active. Wow. 27. Yeah. Amazing. And a fantastic uh, career as far as being surrounded by here, you know, great people, great friends. Right. But also climbing in leadership yourself. Like you came from a place of, you know, I pushed you on the, what is it? You're j- jumping around. Cause it's like you came from this place of not really knowing what you wanted and you just go into this office and you're like, but, and then now here we are. I, and all we know about you is like this climb to leadership. And, but what, uh, yeah. Well, what's interesting to me though is, is, is the values, the values that you got from, 
your father and your uncle, the hard work values, um, I think it's not like it, it, it directly leads you into the, the, the military path, but you, you had that, that hard work ethic and that, you know, that, that ambition uh, that it takes to, to, to commit to something like that. Right, and it, to climb to the top of that once yeah, you've committed. <laughs> it wasn't that they pushed you into that, but they instilled the values in you. No, I, I was fortunate and had good examples young. Yeah. You know, my Uncle Roy and my father and yeah. my mother, they all set excellent examples for me. And, and I think that's so important. I think that's uh, that uh, that's a problem right now. I think often there just aren't those strong examples that, that kids need around them to... You know, to and show them the difference values. between right and wrong. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were never rich, but we weren't poor, you right. know, and that as far as material things. Right. And uh, it was a skilled labor town that I, you know, manufacturing town. Right. Right. Work hard. Right. That's the, that's, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. <laughs> Work hard. <laughs> did you do it? Once you, once you started in the Navy SEALs, did you ever have any doubt? Or oh, this is like, this is the well, path Well, here's for me. another interesting serendipity type of story. The first, I did four years and I got out of the SEALs. Oh, right. And I, I moved back to Ohio. And I was going to coach wrestling and be a student teacher. I'd gotten my degree. And... A hero of mine at the time, Lieutenant Pete Van Hooser, he was a great mentor to me. He calls me in Ohio. So I'm married with a little baby about your son's age back there. And he's like, Mark, you want to come back in the teams? I've got a place for you in a platoon at Team 3, West Coast team. And I, I had missed it, and I went and talked to my dad and my uncle in – you're like 25 at this point. Yeah, yeah. Tw yeah, 25. And they're like, hey, every job, there's about 15% that you don't like. He goes, what do you like about the Navy and what don't you like? And write it down and figure this out. And my uncle's like, Mark, if you go back in, make it a career. You know, do 20 years, get a retirement from it. Right. And that's what I decided to do. So it was very freeing when I went back in because I never hesitated in my career. You know how some people are always ready yeah. to change yeah. their career? So they, temporary. Yeah. They never dip in all the way. Right. Maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. I, and I, I think there's something <laughs> in that. I think almost there are too many choices now and it's like, you know, obviously, t telling someone like you can do you can do anything you want, you can be anyone you want to be, is, is great. But I think there are so many we, we get bombarded with so much information now. People are just like so uncommitted to any any kind of career path because like, maybe I should be this or maybe I should be that or so and so should I do this and so and so. People just get confused. Whereas what you had was clarity. You had clarity of your path. This is what this is Total what I'm going to do. Clarity. This is what I'm going to de dedicate my life to. And like you said, you went into it as a. This is, I'm going to get a retirement plan out of this. And so few people go into a job with that a mindset. Amount of clarity. Yeah. Yeah. It was very helpful. And yeah. I, I talked to my younger SEALs and folks from that point of view. Like, serve like you're going to do a 20-year career even though you're doing four. Like, have that mindset. In right, that, and then you lay the groundwork for that career that it is that you want. Yeah, because you might want to wanna stay in there as you and, go. And people, uh, they lose opportunity when they aren't all in. Yeah. They don't get promoted. Yep. They aren't doing their best for their company or the Navy or wherever they're at. Because they got one yeah. foot in, one foot out. Yeah. It's like, oh, I kind of want to do this, but maybe if something better comes along, maybe I'll do that. It's like... Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we see as business owners, right? It's like you have the people who are like all in for you and you're like, you know, these are the people I can rely on and like I can see us building a massive future with these people. And, you know, you have other people who are just like... In for a season. Yeah, in for a season. And it's like, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, put too much effort into the people that just aren't going to be as as committed and, and right. in it for the long haul. So um, go ahead. Sorry, no, you're... No, ahead. you're I was going to, I just wanted to go back to the, the first four years that you were in. What happened in those four years? Where were you serving? So I was a West Coast SEAL my whole career. And I served at SEAL Team 3 after I graduated from BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition yeah. SEAL 
school. So I got there in April of 84 and got into a platoon and deployed. And at that time, we did an amphibious ready group, which was we rode an a amphibious ship for the Navy. And it was very boring and a big sort of unmotivating experience mm. after going through BUDS. Right. And I was like, holy cow, I just went through all this training <laughs> and my expectations were whole, completely right. deflated. And, you know, a wife and us and Sean are yeah. waiting for you. And I'm like, okay. So I thought, well, the grass would be greener on the other side. Right. And then it turned out when Pete called me and everything lined up, I came back in with clarity and made it a career. Well, especially if the universe is literally grabbing at you. And you just have to listen, you know? <laughs> did, you, did you have any sense of fear? As in fear for, like, fear for your life? As in I could be potentially doing something very dangerous and I have a son and, you know. That actually never even crossed my mind. Wow. Why do you think that is? Is it like, is that life or death uh, feeling not something that you that's a great question. you know what i mean like where does that come from because i feel like some people are plagued with that feeling with everyday yeah. life and so imagining it, it you know this career path that's bro it would be amplified a lot so what is it that you think no i think courage? some folks like i probably sought after adventure mm. and sought the thrill of all the different training that we get in the military which is fantastic training right and very professional you know from all the skill sets diving jumping demolitions shooting you know all those were very exciting and you had to clearly focus on the task as you're going through that it sounds like you saw it more as a sport like as in right. like yeah, it, you know it, it, I, mean, it, I never gave it, it skills any. that you mastered and uh and adventure that you were seeking and when you said it it reminded me of Wyatt our 18 month old oh, okay. who does things knowing that it's dangerous and looks at you with that face of like and I'll say danger and he goes danger and I'm like oh you're into the danger you like the danger <laughs> but whether I mean there, there must have been like missions you were on while you were serving that were that presented that danger that, that you must have gone into with a sense of like, this could be bad. <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah. Later on, I mean, yeah. our training actually was fairly dangerous. I mean, mm. we hurt and lost folks, unfortunately, over the years training. And then when 9-11 happened for me, that was right. the culminating sort of uh, event for the whole nation, right? That called arms and away we went so uh and that kind of changed changed the path of everything right yeah it actually uh did two things for my community it put us on the map and it sort of dropped the scales from our eyes because you know we had a lot of people injured and killed yeah. right. right so it, it, it's serious business yeah right and i mean this is a, this is a a huge question obviously but the lessons in leadership um that you got from the navy seals um can you kind of talk about what, what the main lessons you learned from the navy seals were and that, that helps you that helped you at that time but then has helped you for the rest of your life yeah and certainly you know it, i made every mistake in the book yeah growing sure. up you, you know learn. through the enlisted ranks being defensive losing my temper you know, uh, micromanaging, all these silly things. So the first thing I would think any good leader has to have is control over themselves. So the four areas are intention, attention, physiology, and emotion. So those are the four areas. Intention, what is your intention? And then where do you put your attention and then your physiology and then your emotion. So with that. God, I bet we could go uh, 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 like if, okay, the, the goal is to control oneself. The means to control oneself is through these four avenues. 
where's the gap? Like, I, I bet we all could do that right now, being like, all right, I'm pretty good at controlling my physiology, pretty good at controlling my maybe intention, but man, my attention needs some help or whatever that is. That's a really helpful tool. That's yeah. great. And I'm kind of curious, like, at what point are you conscious of these things? Like, at what stage of serving in the naval service did these things become very conscious in your mind like right from the start it was it was taught to you or is this something you learned no over time like you know in the 80s we were just taught by role models and you got a good mentor or you got a bad example right and people em emulated either one yeah and right. you learn from both and i learned from both right so you know i could be a yeller in the 80s if i had a yeller leader that that's right. how he taught so these tools just came over time, and they actually, you know, my good friend Mark Devine that has seal fit yeah. and everything, he really put everything in the concrete. He was a platoon commander for me. I was a platoon chief right. for him. So so do you think he, he, he basically, well, as far as I, I'm aware, like he was the first person that kind of like put it down on paper. Right, like in, systemized leadership. Yeah. How do you systemize and structure? I would agree he's very comprehensive, you know, and robust on those types of, th of things in leadership, like to be able to put it down on paper. Yeah. Intuitively, we had very good leaders and we had people, like I said before, that weren't so good. Hmm. So over time, you want to be efficient and effective with your leadership. Yeah. And uh, what really drove that to home was 9-11. Uh, like you can't tolerate poor leadership. Right. Right. Yeah. It just is too much at stake. Right. And it's the areas of Afghanistan and Iraq were hard enough. But I feel like we've become so tolerant of poor leadership. Right, gosh. Like it's almost like... We let, we let poor leaders get away with it almost every time. <laughs> so controlling oneself was your first, was kind of your yeah, first Yeah, that's sort of the, like being a good leader is first of all being able to control those four areas. Mm. And like, you know, be lead by example whenever possible. I mean, obviously when you're going up, you can't lead by example on everything. But if, you, you know, you want to be out, you want to be interested in your people, you don't want to be distant. People know if you're genuine or not. They Absolutely. feel that. You can yeah. feel that. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's character, that's integrity, right? And that's, and that's, that's it, it, from what it sounds, intention. Like, you know, if it, it, the same rules that apply to controlling yourself is also, it seems like it works in relationships too. Like intention, attention, you know, are uh, the physiological, uh, you know, relationship that we have, body language, da, 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 all of that. And then what was the fourth? Help me out. Intention, attention. Emotion, yeah. yes. And, you know, how you deal with people emotionally. So yeah. it, it, controlling yourself and then being able to have better relationships, it sounds like all four of those categories uh, <laughs> still apply. I, I had this great thing the other day. It's, it's like it, it, the, the job that you do is not important. It's how you do the job that really matters, like no matter what the job is. So it's like you don't have to be a Navy SEAL to have the qualities of, of a Navy SEAL. Or no, to, no, you know, right, like right. You have to like, in everything you do, in every job you do, it's how you do the job, the values that you have, the, you know, the way that you treat the people around you when you're doing that job, um, the way that you communicate, you know, all these things mm -hmm. um, are achievable in, in any job, no matter what you do. And in the end, that's what you become known for. You're not known for the job that you have, the job that you do. You're known for how you did that job and who you were while you were doing it. And you're right there in it. You're known for how you make people feel. Yeah. Yes. Like you walk One, in the room. How do you feel about that person walking in the room? Are you drawn to them? Or is it like, oh my goodness. Yeah, this fucker again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my best like skippers, they would walk around the command and just chat with everybody mm. and know your kids' names, know the wife's name, you know, take a real interest. Yeah. And you'd walk in their office and they'd have a list of everybody's name 
family and, and family up on the wall. Wow. That's so great. they were very that is some interest. intention right there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then others wouldn't, you know, there was a, there was a difference. So do you think, um, going back to the Mark Devine thing, do you think but before like he published the book and before Jocko became, became so, so vocal and stuff like that, do you think, um, it was more like, it was not not secrecy, but like the Navy SEAL was almost like a mystery to most people. And then suddenly it was like opened up and, and like <clears throat> was revealed. Like th these are the, the lessons you can learn from the Navy SEALs as opposed to it being like kind of hidden. Right. Like no, when did the brand come alive? Yeah. Really because it became, yeah. yeah it became well, I, brand, I think right? post 9-11, right. it really, that really was it. exploded. Mm. But I mean, even Dick Marcinko wrote rogue warrior years ago and he was the first dev group skipper so there's been like trickles right that have come out over the years but i think post 9 11 is when the business world you know that whole sort of brand of the navy seal exploded and i think because i know a bunch of people that have been on the, the kokoro weekend mm -hmm. and um, they, they've sort of expressed how life-changing it was and how real it was and how you know i think we've all just gotten so caught up with like modernity and, and and technology and a bunch of shit that doesn't really matter and then when you go to something like that where everything is taken away and everything is torn down to, to your basic survival instincts and you know what really matters you know it's it's a very it's a, it's a it, it's such a powerful moment to people because it is so real um, whereas opposed to like their daily lives where they're surrounded by so much that's so fake. Um, it became almost like, um, you know, it became popular because it was just, it was something that the rest of us in society seem to have got so far away from. And then to be taken back to something so raw and so, so original and so powerful, it's, it's, a, it's a, it, it became a, um, you know, almost like a, Something that, that, that came from something so serious like Buds, something so important, something so like this is only for the elite of the elite of the elite to suddenly be like, you can come and do this weekend and you're not going to be a Navy SEAL by the end of it, but you're going to have some kind of experience that gets you closer to, to, to that. Uh, people so like became, the values, the values and the value and, 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 and the mental toughness and the, you know, just, just the awareness of self. Um, I think that was hugely appealing for people at that time when Mark, you know, first came about. It was almost like people were desperate for it. People were desperate for something more real <laughs> that broke them down to their like right. basic self, as opposed to like you know ourselves these days. I, I feel like we're kind of made up of all this other stuff because there's so much nonsense all around us. I think sometimes it's hard to see yourself as your you know your basic self, whereas something like the Kokoro, you know, takes you back to you know, you, you, all you can do is, you know, the, the physiology that you talked about, you can be physical, you can be, you know, you can either survive or you can break or you can support those around you or, you know, all these basic elements that you don't have any kind of like, you know, there's no luxury, there's no technology, there's nothing to kind of like, you can't look at your Instagram for five minutes and you know, all the stuff that you kind of rely on, all the crutches that you, you rely on and, and all the distractions that you rely on in your daily life all of that's gone and you just have your basic self. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, it's hugely appealing to a lot of people. <laughs> no, I agree. And just to go back a little bit, like I was just an average athlete, right? Yeah. And I just was fortunate to make it through buds uninjured and to not quit. But I had great teammates around me mm. and we actually shook hands before we went into hell week that the only way we would leave would be beyond our control right yeah it's so totally that meant we would yeah. be taken off the field right what, that we aren't going to go quit like right and we shook hands on that that was real powerful what's the percentage of people that make it through buds it's changed over the years i think they are doing better with less attrition now, but it's been pretty consistent at 80% attrition. Wow. Is what I understand. Mm -hmm. 
Got so to that, really want it. Yeah, you got to really, really fucking want it. <laughs> well, I, cause I know a couple of guys that did the Kokoro, uh, they did it like twice. The first time they did it and it was amazing and it changed everything and they had a really strong why as to why they were doing it. The second time they did it, they didn't have as strong a why anymore. They just had such a good experience the first time. They kind of took the second time and like, oh, I'm going to go and do it again. But because they'd lost their why, they bailed. They quit after the first day just because they'd lost their strong sense of why, you know. I think that really is the biggest uh, like wonder about people in armed forces. Like the awe of like, wow, the discipline, the ability to uh, like really put your head down and do some work and to commit your life to something and to commit your years to something beyond you. You know, like the, the, um, the, uh, the, the kind of why and purpose has to be very strong mm. for somebody to commit their life, you know? Um, I think that's why we respect and appreciate you so much because you, like, you, you're someone who has a strong sense of why and purpose for your life. You've done that throughout your entire life. And now you've committed that to helping other people and business owners do that for their lives, you know? Um, well, I appreciate that. Yeah. That's very kind. Of you. <laughs> I mean, let's go into that. I, I mean, j just so every, everyone's aware, what, what, what do you really do right now? Like, how are you, how are you spreading this message? Well, I mean, I'm working with Mark Devine. Yeah. So I'm an independent contractor for him. How long have you been working with Seal Fit? Three years, I think. And this last year's just been, you know, horrible with right. the of COVID yeah. shutdowns and everything. So that's been a very good mission, post-retirement mission for me, because I do like serving and helping and, you know, helping others in that regard. Yeah. And then additionally, you know, the neighbors around my house, like I've got a few businessmen that I'll go have coffee with at Starbucks and we'll talk about, you know, let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. Give me something to... Yeah. yeah, I mean, you always become like a therapist. Right? Almost, well, but like not... Business, no, I, this business, business consulting therapy. <laughs> therapy. Yeah, because it's like, we come in and we're like, oh, we need system and structures and blah, blah, blah. And I hear that you're the man. And then you come back to us and be like, but what do you really care about? You know, and what, it, what you know, you're like, well, systems, we'll get to that. What are your values, you know? Yeah, yeah, but it's like, it is that conversation of people, people go into it thinking it's going to be about one thing, but really it's about another Really, it's a lot more simple. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this before. Like, really, it all comes down to purpose and what your purpose is, and you trying to get that purpose out of someone, right? Because once they have what their purpose is, everything else comes falls into line. line. Absolutely, yeah. and it takes a while to write that down and then edit it over time, and hmm. to actually write your purpose statement down. Do you want to share yours? I have it uh, sort of generally. Yeah, which is. I will protect, love, and serve my family, my community, and my country. And then I will be very strong in conservation for wildlife. Hmm. And I will know that life is a false horizon and you're always seeking improvement. So those are the three areas. Yeah, of that's my great. Program. How did you come to build that? Uh, like you said, it takes time. Was there a system of how you built this? Was there, you know, how how would you suggest a person find and yeah. and come up with their own purpose? Well, the equation really is making a list of your passions and your principles. That's the math equation. Yeah, we call the principles your non-negotiables, which is like right. You know, so, what are your passions? What are your principles? Equals your purpose. So that takes a little while to have some thought on those and actually physically write them down right. over time and then start really digging in on, okay, well, my priority is my family, you know, and then my community and then my country. And, and then, you know, you take it from there, like your interests, like my hobbies are hunting and fishing. So I'm, I love wildlife and I, like the conservation of wildlife. And then I know we're always seeking improvement our whole life. Right. Like you never get there. No. Right. Ever. Ever. Yeah. So you're Yeah, old. I think there's an assumption. Once I get to 40, I'll pretty much have it figured out. It's like, 
<laughs> no fucking chance. So you're always, you know, there's a false horizon. You make it, and then there's something, other behavior you have to correct or, you know, something that you're working on. I like that. So passions times principles equals, equals purpose. purpose. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about like, you know, kids and the next generation and, and modern lifestyle and, and, you know, this whole, this whole concern about social media and so forth that we're on now. Like, how do you, how do you process that? How do you deal with that? Like having, it's a real problem. And, you know, there's just addictions with that and, you know, social pressure with it, with our youth and, it's a really hard parenting issue yeah. that I I don't have a clear answer on. No. Yeah. But I, I you know I think I think it is a parenting thing to a large degree. I um, mean I think we all just have to be as parents as very very conscious and very aware of the the, the, the dangers of it and try and communicate that that right. danger and, and and just try and you know let our kids know that it's not real. That world is not a real world. Mm -hmm. It's. It's a created thing. Right. It's, it's This is a tool and it is a habit forming tool, like acknowledging like this is a tool and we can use it for great things, right? Like we're going to advertise this podcast on social media, right? So here we are. It's yep. like using it for good, but then they, like acknowledging that it's a habit forming tool and that you can go down the rabbit hole and to, you know, to try to protect yourself from, from that rabbit hole. Right. So hard. We think I, about that with Wyatt. Even little things like, like I, he's 18 months old and how much screen time is too much. Luckily, he doesn't care about the screens yet. He's not like glued onto it. But then you see like, you know, like my niece and nephew and they're all up on their iPads and then there's homeschools and there's virtual learnings now. And it's oh, like yeah. before a year ago it was get your kids off social media. And now it's like, well, now it, it, distance yeah. learning is all we have. Yeah. It's like so hard to manage. You know, it is that, that, I mean, that's a terrifying thing. And that's, you know, what we, we've talked about, like the environment that we want to bring Wyatt up in. It's like you, you, you basically, we, we basically want, uh, you know, an outdoorsy kind of childhood for Wyatt. We want him to experience nature and, and to be playing outside and having, a, having a childhood. Whereas like, obviously every, everything in the last year has been, like you said, all over like computers and, and. You know, it, it just opens up, opens up kids to just nonstop social media, nonstop online interactions, um, and, and and just that whole fake world that isn't that isn't real. Yeah, I and mean, I, even you just saying how you grew up, Mark. It's like you know, you grew up on a dairy farm. Like yeah. you were, uh, you know, you. <laughs> it's grew, a real world. It's a real world, <laughs> doing things and and taking care of animals and taking care of your environment, and that now literally paved the way for that your purpose to have everything to do with, you know, family uh, conservation, and you know, it's like those principles were landed from a from a, a young, uh, you know, from being really young. So it's like you worry because you want those. The, you know, you want the love of the great outdoors to yeah. be with everyone, but we're all stuck inside, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really a mission to keep our kids as connected to the real world as we, we possibly can and keep them away from the virtual world as much as possible. Yeah. And I'm not judging, <laughs> but I do think some parents use electronics as a babysitter. Sure. Right. And then, you know, Hey, go play, go watch, you know, play a video game or, or whatever right and uh yeah and it starts <clears throat> easy enough like we were on the um you know like it starts off in a long car ride and it's like you know you're screaming in the back of a long car ride and you're like here watch this and then that works and then you're like oh watch it at the, when you're out at a restaurant just sit there and sit still and look at you know it, it, it it's just like it's a habit that then gets reinforced and reinforced. So it's not like, oh, you're bad and you're letting your kids watch green time, but it does. It becomes a babysitter it's because it's, it's just it's Easy. Just hypnotizing them. Hypnotizing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, You're but it's a problem. Rush. And, you, oh, yeah. you know, maybe we just, I, I don't really have an answer for it yeah. as, as far as it's a generational issue that I didn't have to r really deal with. Yeah, I mean, it's such a new thing. I mean, you know, I didn't deal with it when I, when I was growing up. I, I didn't have a phone till 
I don't know how to find themselves in my like mid twenties. I was 16, but you know, to go what social media does, it just like tells you everything you don't have and everything. You right. Have, and it's like everything feeling, everybody else has. It's a feeling that we're trying to sell you on a feeling. Yeah. So it's trying to figure out how do we get people to figure out? You're probably not ever going to figure out, but you got to keep improving and working on that. But this is going to help you get there. And then you get there you buy the product and you're like, this is not that doing anything. Didn't work. It didn't yeah. work. What well, you have to level up by tier three and now you have it. And it's just, like you said, unless you're in those situations growing up to get a little bit of hardship, learn, you know, like you said, you were able to find your purpose, you know, kind of like, I just want to have adventure. And that's really why I got into this. It's not yeah. selfish, but it's why you did it. You know, right. you're not going to find your, you're not going to find your purpose on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because what you were saying is like it, uh, social media or just marketing in general is designed to sell. It's designed to show the gap right? It's, you know, here's the issue. And my solution is just on the other side of this paywall, right? That's like the, that's <laughs> essentially what literally all marketing is. And we, all, you know, it's like, here's the problem. We provide a solution, come in, come and get it. So it almost kind of comes in this place of like contentment, you know, that like feeling enough, doing enough, being enough, or finding thrill and excitement and adventure in things that aren't just on the other side of a paywall, right? That's not right. like just purchasing something. You know, we, you seek out adventure th or a purpose through taking care of animals, through blah, 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 you know, like through, through serving, through having a family, through like having a business that you have to, you know, having employees, having blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, finding that contentment that isn't, uh, like just promoting the gap, like promoting what you don't have, you know? Well, and also this is, this, this is what brings us back to the gym, right? This is why we all live, love the gym so much because at least it's a real experience. Your relationship with the barbell is a real experience. It, it, your you relationship know. with your coach. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, <laughs> your it's, relationship it's, with yourself, your own self-awareness. The gym is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you say, sometimes you work from the inside out and sometimes you work from the outside in and you learn so much about yourself in those, it, it, within that yeah. hour experience of being you know, in a class. And again, I, I think why in the last year, like it's been such a huge fucking issue for people is because everything real that existed was taken away and everything that was poisonous and virtual and like... Was amplified. Was amplified. Yeah. So a lot of people's only experience in the last year has been an online virtual experience mm -hmm. and it's been devastating for people's mental health. Mm. Like you said, people can buy leadership, they can buy this, they can buy right. that. And it's like, it, those aren't the best people to tell me what to do. Well, why right. can't you just say, it's because you're eating too much of this, of that. Well, sugar industry gives them this or this people give them that. So we're never actually getting the truth of the matter. Right. You can say, hey, we need a little bit of healthier lifestyle. You can't tell people that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. That won't make us money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we all need to get back to some, some real experiences for sure. Amen. Um, and on that subject, you, you talked a little bit about, I want to talk about your, how you spend your, your free time now and your relaxation time, which you've, you've earned. Uh, hunting, fishing, that kind of thing. And you, you travel a little bit and you, you told me you had like a, a motorhome, right? Basically, yeah. We that have you... a fifth wheel. My yeah, wife and I well. do, so we use that periodically, just you know, to go around the country and recon America. Right. And and how is that now? Like, how do you how do you how is that experience of America now as opposed to like twenty years ago? Is it like? Well, is it... we're so blessed. Like I've been all over the world. Yeah. So I'm just grateful that I'm an American. Our country's vast, a lot of different people in our country. Yeah, a lot of different. And we have so many treasures landscapes. here. A lot of yeah. Landscapes, yeah. Parks, just so much opportunity here yeah. in America. Yeah, it's a beautiful country. And I think, you know, often, you know. That's we, what brought we, Pete here. Yeah, Dreaming and, and, and often there's just so much bad news on, on the television and so forth that you forget what a beautiful country it is. Uh, um, this, I mean, we, and we live so well. Yeah. Like a lot of people live very, very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And we have it very good here. Yeah. And uh, I'm just grateful that I was born here and had the opportunity that I've had in my life here. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. And uh, it's a lot of fun now to go with a fifth wheel and I pick bet. a headquarters area 
and park it, you know, and then do little day trips out. And yeah. I like the hunting and fishing, and I duck hunt, and then I go elk hunting and wild boar nice. hunting. Guns or bows? Uh, gun, rifles. Yeah. And then I saltwater fish, ocean oh, fish. Nice. Yeah. That's what's in your goodie. Yeah. 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 yeah Mark was good enough to bring me a goodie package today That's full so of all nice. the good stuff. All the good stuff, which I'm super excited about. <laughs> um, uh, uh, favorite places in America? Like that you've. My favorite place in America is San Diego. Oh, yeah? Lucky huh. enough to be your home. Yeah. No, your I mean, every time I come home. back there, I just, uh, it's. It's changed, it's grown, the population's gotten bigger, but it's still the vibe, the energy, the weather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't duplicate California wherever you go. Uh, California, the state of California is just amazing. Yeah. I wish they uh, stopped fucking it up. The the other areas, you know, have their appeal. I mean, you know, we've gone to Florida and Texas and... Yeah, all over, but there's nothing like coming back to San Diego. Mm, it's interesting to hear you say that. Um, so let's 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 take this right back to the beginning. So people that are listening in that are kind of in a place where they they know they need to make a change, they want to find a, a greater sense of purpose. How do they start? How do they start this journey? Well, there's a lot of excellent books out there. Like, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Like, you know, Mark Devine has some really excellent books. I highly recommend him. Jocko's got some great books. Uh, there's, you, you know, read the Stephen Pressfield books. Mm hmm. Yeah. That was a great one as well. Yeah, he has good ones. So the book, you know, I'm an avid reader, I'm always reading a book. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll help. Uh, surrounding yourself with like-minded people. Mm. It's, I mean, you just said books, and that honestly is a great place to start. Like, if you don't know your own purpose, then learn uh, hearing what other people's purpose <laughs> is huge. You know, right. perspective that other people have, and you're just in a state of being a sponge and learning as much as you can, and signing up for like the journey of like, all right, I'm going to take what I learned from other people. I'm going to listen. I'm going to learn. I'm going to respect, <laughs> and I'm going to be lighthearted. <laughs> it's funny the the surround yourself with the right people um this is something like we've been saying for years like you become who you hang around um and it's something we say but it is such a powerful thing like if you if you do surround yourself with forward thinking positive growth mindset right. people all the time you're in such a different place than if you are spending the company in people who are negative and always right. like on a downer right. and right, bring, right. bring you down with them and it's it's and you don't even realize it's happening until you break away, it's like I can't spend any more time with these people. It's 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 bad for me. It's bad for yeah. my mind. Right. That I view that like the news. Yeah. Yes, it is. I, I mean, it really is. Yeah. It really is. It really is. It, it's a. You know, it's it's a it's a thing that creeps up on you. You you don't realize it's happening, and then after a while, it's like I mean, same thing with the news. I mean, I, in the in the heart of the, the, the pandemic, I was watching it all the time, and it was it was driving me insane. And as soon as you like turn it off and realize that you know you don't need it <laughs> you don't actually you, know, need you, it. you don't actually need it you you know you do Especially feel a lot better the news didn't change that often right like, it know, was the same, the same shit thing over are. and over yeah. <laughs> and i think if people get something on the calendar to shoot for like a goal yes uh, like you know i'm going to run a half marathon in yes. july or goal you know, some yeah. type of goals or fiscal goals or you know but get those goals down that's there's four areas of mental toughness that we work on. Goal setting, arousal control, visualization, and positive self-talk. Mm. So those are actually taught to SEAL candidates, those four things. Those are in our curriculum. And, you know, you break those down into their own categories, right? Like a goal... You know, we use the acronym SMART, mm. specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. and timely, and then with a purpose. And then arousal control, we talked about, there's all kinds of breathing that you can do, that you can research and do 
yoga is another great area, right, for for that type of thing. And then we have uh, positive self-talk, like while you're breathing, I can do this. Right. Right. It's amazing what affirmations do. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, it, like you say, fake it till you make it true. Like tell the story to yourself. <laughs> yeah, we say a lot, tell, tell yourself a, a different story. Um, because if, if, if someone's been telling themselves the, the same story for, for years, and I see it all the time, oh, I, I'm only the person that can do this. And it's not even like, it's not like a conscious negative thing. It's like, I'm not good enough. It's like, I'm only good enough to do this, or I'm only strong enough to lift that, or I'm only capable of these things. Right. It, they get themselves in that same mindset. And it's like, so they always lift the same weight. They always pull the same time. You know, they always do things a certain way. And it's just because they've got themselves in that, in that very limited mindset. But as soon as you get them to tell themselves a different story, well, I'm actually the person that can do this, or that if I work hard enough, I can get to this, then you see people really grow. Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 it's an easy, easy trap to fall into. And I've seen it so many times. Um, people just tell themselves a certain story about themselves that this is who I am and this is what I can expect for myself. Right. Yeah. You know? And then it's true. Yeah. Right. So and that, it's hard because they might not necessarily think that it's uh, negative. They're being quote unquote realistic. Uh, it, right. But the positive self-talk is like, well, just tell yourself the best story possible. Like, it, it, you know, tell yourself the best story possible instead of the the realistic or the pragmatic one. Because otherwise, yeah, you do, like, you don't think you're being negative. You're like, oh, I, I'm, not a, I'm not negative. I'm just a realist. It's like, well, you're also, by being a quote-unquote realist, you're capping your limit by saying you're only able to do this thing, you know? So tell yourself the best story possible, and then all of a sudden you get to that next level. Yeah. And that's why you surround yourself with people who are going to challenge you. Yes. Also. Yes. So they're not pushing you. You're not changing or moving. Then your story gets yeah. the same. You need some good mental feedback or yeah. surrounding feedback. Yeah. And then in a safe way, people should face their fears because mm. mm. people have uh, behavior changes over fears that they won't even entertain doing something, and they should incrementally break that wall. Right. And then that's self improvement right there. Right. Like, so do something that scares you. Yeah, it's almost like write down five things that scare you. And yeah, over and, time, and over time, and uh, you know, or you had this event when you were ten, right? And you've never gone back in the pool because you know you right. thought you had a near drowning. Yeah, and now you're thirty, right? So those carry over if they aren't faced. Yeah. And or even little things like, uh, like for us, I know it's confrontation, right? Like human interaction of like, uh, how, how you deal with like negative feedback or things like that. Like the things it, like you're afraid of dealing with like confrontation or feeling. So it's not necessarily like always a life or death thing that you want to, you know, that you right. want to approach. You it's know, even those little things. You know what the, you know what the thing is these days about negative feedback is it's so easy to give negative feedback. Like in the old days, like if you want to give me negative feedback, you've got to talk to my face. These days, people can just write negative feedback on your Instagram post. And send it from an anonymous email. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, that's a different world. It's a different yeah. world. Gratefully, yeah. I don't live in. You know, I, <laughs> right. I never had that occur because. Uh, yeah. And know, it becomes but, a real thing of like how you process it because you know it doesn't mean anything. You know it's bullshit. You know it's cowardly. You know, it's mm. everything that's wrong with modern society, but you, it's still hard to not let it affect you in some way. Absolutely. You know? I can see that. Yeah. yeah. So confrontation to me should always just be planned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Meaning, okay, someone's not up to standard in my crew. I'm going to observe that and then plan a sit down with them later. Yeah. And... I might even have a, a, someone else there with me. And depending on what it is, uh, you take it from there. But one thing that works really good, at least in the military, is a letter of instruction for correction. Like, hey, Johnny, we've seen this behavior. We're giving you X amount of time to correct this behavior. Like being late, you know, some yeah, easy yeah. skill. Right. Yeah. Okay, sign this. Because you won't be in the platoon any longer if you don't, you don't do something about it. it. Yeah. 
but very rarely, unless it was a safety thing, would I ever jump right in while it was happening. Right, in the confrontation. Right. Yeah. You don't meet I the fire that. with fire. When I was young, I would be very, like, vocal, right. like, and didn't know any better. Very reactionary. Right. Yeah. Very reactionary. But over time, learning how people react to that, like, you break relationships like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And every dog deserves two bites. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Come on in. You shouldn't have bit that guy's yeah. shins. <laughs> uh, Figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, we've chance. always we've always kind of been like that. We've always been very kind of like you know, everybody deserves two chances. Um, Depending, and, you know, on yeah, what it of is, course, obviously. within reason, yeah. within reason. Um, but you know, I, I think that is something like as, as business owners uh, and. You know, as, as a company, you know, when you're trying to do things the right way and you're trying to do things humanely and you're trying to do, you're trying to build a business built on values and a business that you can be proud of and a business that treats people well and all that kind of stuff. You know, you're always, you're always kind of walking that line between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and whether, whether you, whether people can be, you know, nurtured and, and nourished and, and, and you know, brought into line or in the way that they, they need to be, or whether it's just like not going to happen, not going to work, not going to be, they just don't fit with your values. They just don't fit with the, with the mission of the, the company kind of thing. Right. And that's something you've always, I guess you're always assessing, you're always revisiting, you're always like, you know, and, and I guess it changes as well as companies change as, as companies grow, like maybe it worked at one time, maybe it doesn't work anymore. Um, and it, it takes constant review and constant, you know, attention. It's a math equation. It's a chemistry yeah. alchemy, right? A good team, a good right. resilient team. Yeah. Like that's not easy to put together. It's not. Yeah. It's and not. And then it takes constant care and feeding. Yeah. So once you get that team together, okay, how do you maintain that esprit de corps? You know, what yes. battle rhythm of communications do you do? What fun team building events do you incorporate right. you know how do you respond when someone's sick their mother's sick do you go and visit you know them as an owner you know there's all these different nuances of how big is your company you know what's your span of control right yeah. and engagement with your team it sounds like you know like the uh, be making an environment that teams want to be a part of. So, right. you know, like, right. you know, their families, you know, their, their lives, you know what they're watching on Netflix, you know, about, you know, you guys have more fun. It's lighthearted. It's not, you know, always work and no play. Right. Right. So, so I'm reading that legacy book that you gave me. Yeah. The, the all blacks one, all Blacks. such a good book. And it, what's great about this book and, and about our conversations, the Navy SEALs, and about First Athletic Club, like it all comes back to, to teamwork and it all comes back to, you know, shared values, shared mission, and, and everybody, you know, in support of one, of one direction kind of thing. And, um, you know, that book is full of, you know, great little tips and um, processes and experiences that they went through to get to an unstoppable team, a team that was, you know, the best in the world yeah. um, that, you know, and everyone knows, you know, the All Blacks are the, the greatest rugby team of all, of all time, but they had, they went through a patch where they won and they, they had to like reassess, adjust and recommit to their brand, recommit to their own brand, recommit to their own sense of purpose. And um, it's fascinating for me to, to, to read that book. And it really makes you think like, if we are going to be a successful business and it's a successful brand, then it really is about building a team um, that supports that brand. Um, that's not in it specifically just for themselves, but they're in it because they believe in in, in what you're doing and what your what the purpose of your company is, right. kind of thing. Right. And that um, the uh, because it's through shared vision and shared yeah. values. Like we're all kind of in, uh, you know, we uh, we all got the same relative purpose. 
uh, and relative values in terms of the things that we care about and the way that we want to help and serve people and yeah. the imprint that we want to put on this world. And now all just putting that together to be like, all right, let's do this. Well, I think I think everyone gets into this and everyone sort of, sort of arrived at this place because they have a love of fitness and a love of helping people and a love of coaching, which is great in the beginning. And it gets people through the door on that thing. But you get to a certain point where all those individual pursuits aren't enough anymore because a company can't survive like that. A company can't survive on a bunch of individuals pursuing their own purpose within these four walls. So at a certain point, it takes a reassessment. It's like, well, Here's for this to going. be successful, we all need to have a common direction here and a common set of values and a common purpose. Um, and we all need to, need to unite underneath that umbrella. Otherwise, you lose the match. <laughs> Right, 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 right. right. I and mean, then the same thing in the Navy no, SEALs. If you don't have complete unity, the mission fails. Yeah. Right. And to be resilient. Yeah. Meaning, you know, you're going to stumble. Okay. How do re you recover? Well, you're optimistic. You know, you have standards. You have accountability. Yeah. You have all these things in place to be a resilient team. Yeah. And it's like I see, I see a, lot of, a lot of businesses, a lot of gyms that fail and it wasn't because they didn't have great ideas and it wasn't because they didn't have the right equipment or they didn't have a great space it was simply because the team fell apart like people just wanted to do their own thing or branched off or you know and certain right. or and, a leadership lost or the leadership overall lost sense the, lost, or, of yeah. direction and so that perpetuated it yeah and that's know. something we have to be accountable yeah. for you know if, if we fuck up with our leadership then the whole thing falls apart right they say your business doesn't grow until you do yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> What's well, interesting, my wife and I do a local Orange Theory there in Chula Vista. And the same people go to the same class, and it's fun. Like, it's a lot of fun because the camaraderie mm -hmm. and the same folks. Mm -hmm. So that social interaction of working out, for 55 minutes in a class is just fantastic. Exactly. Yeah. And again, that, so, that social interaction is what's so important about the gym and why gyms should never have been closed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we'll leave it there. Mark, you, Mark, thank you so much for coming in, man. Oh, thank um, you. Every time I talk Enjoyed to you, I, it. I, I, I think more positively about, about the future uh, of, of, <laughs> of everything that we're doing and um, oh, yeah. just in general of... Um, you know, I think it's easy. It's easier to, to to be negative right now. It's easier to go on a bit of a downer with everything that we've been through. Um, but I think, you know, we've fought hard to like get through this and to to to, to work positively towards a better future. And our conversations have helped, you yeah. know, further that 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 mindset and that 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 conscious positivity and that conscious kind of like determination to not only get through this but to be a fucking successful company um, and, and to build a great fucking team. Um, and, you know, like I said, like our conversations and the recommendations you've given to me and the things that I've been reading and the conversations that me and Emily have have really helped us, like, you know, again, solidify our own purpose and our company's purpose and so That's forth. That's awesome. So, I'm so, so happy thank you for that. And and I'm, I can't wait to have more conversations yeah. with you and more experiences with you because I know it's only going to be so they're going to get better and better. Well, everybody should come to Pharaoh's Athletic Club. <laughs> there you go. Get a workout in. Let's get it done. <laughs> That's right. Get it done. Get it done. All right, man. Well, I'll see you real soon. Thank you, Thanks sir. Thanks for coming Thank in. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Brandon. Thank um, you. Sign off. Oh, I, I'm going to sign. <laughs> uh, okay, guys. Thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot for tuning in. Uh, we are Pharaoh's Athletic Club. Don't forget, you can find us at 1316 Glendale Boulevard. Find us on Instagram at Pharaoh's Echo Park. Um, you can find this podcast on all good podcast applications. And um, we will be back with you uh, next week. So take care till then and thanks. See ya. Bye.